Welcome to another episode of the Rising Coaches Podcast. I'm your host, Doug Caputo, alongside your co-host, Alan Major, and we are excited to get to speak with one of the hot names in the coaching industry right now and the current head coach at Indiana Wesleyan University, Coach Greg Tonegal. Coach Tonegal, what's going on? Man, I appreciate you guys having me. And, and by the way, that was probably the coolest intro that I've of a podcast that I've been on yet. So <laughs> I'm already loving this. We're off to a hell of a start. We're off to a hell of a start. Love it. Thank you, Love everybody, it. for attending. See you next time. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> we did our job. Hey, man. Now, Greg, first of all, congrats on um, the 500 wins, of course, because winning is hard, period. I don't care. You know, throw the level out the window. I mean, winning is hard, no matter what area you're coaching in. So phenomenal job with that. And then, you know, I, I know the stuff you're going to share is going to be a home run, man. So we appreciate you being on. I know it's thick of the season right now, and there's real bullets flying as we speak. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you. It doesn't you. feel like 500 right now. You know, as you're walking into practice, you're like, are we going to win another one? <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's right. That's right. No, but that's a, that mind that mentality is what got you to 500. That's the beauty of it. You know, it's like every day is day one. You just short memory, turn the page, keep it moving. So, but we appreciate you. Thank you. So to give you an idea of how the show is going to go, um, we're going to talk a little bit about, of course, your coaching career as well as your journey. So one, where you started as a player, then how it grew into where you are now and all of the steps in between. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about where you're currently at, you know, your coaching philosophy, what you've done to make make sure, of course, your team is, is as successful as you have been. And we'll talk about your big accolade. I know you touched it there in a second, but then also talking about like, kind of like the NAIA and coaching there because um, you are our first coach to be coaching in the NAIA that we've got to speak with. So, of course, just seeing a different dynamic there. And then we'll get into a final segment just to kind of humanize you, um, let everybody kind of get to meet you as a person, right? So outside of the coaching realm. But kind of going back, uh, you started off your playing career at Valparaiso, and I should say ended your Val uh, career at Valparaiso as well, under head coach Scott Drew. So – those experiences you had there, some things that you learned in your playing career, just kind of give us the idea of that and talk about it. Yeah, I mean, in one sense, my my playing career was a little bit of a disaster. Um, <laughs> and in another sense, it led me into coaching. I uh, I played six years of college basketball. And in, because of that, I was kind of on the, the back end of some jokes about being the old guy in the dinosaur. In fact, <laughs> quick story, my sixth year um, – Actually, Scott Drew, I played for him my fifth year. Homer came back out of retirement my sixth year. Mm. Make it to the NCAA tournament. And uh, they're doing this big thing in the USA Today about the top players to watch. And so they do this interview with me. And I'm like, man, this is going to be awesome. Like, I'm one of the guys that's coming out in the, uh, the USA Today. So they go through all these guys. And there were some amazing guys on there, some really good players. And then they get to me. And, the, and they call me Methuselah, which is <laughs> You know any Bible references? It's the oldest man to ever live. Oh, they say nothing about like nine nine hundred and sixty years or something. Yeah, like they that. say yeah. nothing about my game, my attributes. They're just like he's old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in some ways, that you know that kind of sums up you know my playing career. I tore my ACL my freshman year, and I had five consecutive surgeries, kind of about every wow. eighteen months. And mm. but it was during that time I sat the bench and I learned the game from a completely different perspective. I was in coaching meetings throughout uh, mm -hmm. after games, you know, players go home and, and do whatever. I'm in the coach's office talking about how can we get better? Mm -hmm. And that, that whole process was like coaching 101. Uh, Cause I didn't go into college really wanting to coach, but when something's taken from you that you love so much, you, you realize the value of it. And I realized the value of the game of basketball, but then I also realized the value of leadership. Like mm -hmm. I could help my team win sitting on the end of the bench. Sure. So that, that's how I got into coaching, uh, you know, and Coach Drew was, was gracious enough to keep me on. Uh, there wasn't a spot when I graduated, but I kept saying, like, look, I'll sleep on your floor. Uh, you know, I ended up sleeping on the floor of a, of a, a booster um, just to get started, and I, I signed up for free. Um, I was like, look, you don't have to pay me. I just want to get my foot in the door. And you guys know this. Coaching's the most yep. difficult profession to get your foot in the door. Oh, man. But if you can just get it in the door and then fight your way in, you got a shot. And that's no question it for me. No, you you just it's it's just uh, Doug is probably laughing as I'm about to say this, but every episode somebody pulls and taps into that man is just like the, the the whatever it takes mentality, right? And just taking leaps of faith where you just don't you don't 
you don't really care what's on the other side. You know that what you got right in front of you is what you got. And you just try to do the best you can with that. And so, uh, like I said, I knew this would be a home run. And already, just with that right there, um, that's perfect. Because that's exactly uh, what comes up on here a lot, an awful lot. And then following your playing career, so you did another year. I, you did, or excuse me, you were the uh, director of basketball operations at Valpo. Um, talk about the experiences now being on the other side of the ball and, you know, maybe some things that you learned that you still continue to this day. So those roles were always mixed. So going into my sixth year, I, I told coach, I said, I, I can't play, but I'll help coach. I'll stay on scholarship and I'll finish my master's. Well, in January, our starting point guard went down with an injury and, mm. uh, coach calls me, I'm not making this up. He calls me at 10 o'clock at night, says, I need you to play tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, tomorrow? <laughs> he said, yeah. He's like, look, that, we'll, we'll keep you short stints. We, like, you understand the offense. And uh, oh, man. I'm like, well, I can't say no to coach. Like, he gave me this job. So I, I suit up the next day. Wow. And uh, I mean, I had kind of, I had run some drills in practice, but I hadn't done anything, you know, significant. Well, that was a, a significant game for us. We were playing Oakland um, at mm. the time, and they had a really good player. So Larry Bird, who was the uh, VP of, of the Pacers, was in. So I'm warming up and I just can't take my eyes off Larry Bird. He's sitting press row and wow. I could care less about the game because I'm a Bird fan. You know, I grew yeah. up in Indiana I'm through and through. And uh, it was my first game back. Couldn't even tell you really what happened, but we won. I get pulled into this the media afterwards and I get a conversation with Larry Bird. And I'm like, I, look, whatever happens from here, yeah. on out, it doesn't <laughs> right. matter. I just no met question. Larry Bird. He came to watch me play. <laughs> I care less who I was, but uh, – so then I kind of the rest of the season, I didn't practice, but I played games because this kid ended up missing the rest of the year. And uh, and coach knew it. I mean, I was on a bad knee, a bad ankle. And uh, the, I had the players respect enough to, to say, look, we understand you may not practice, but we need you for games. But I'm mm -hmm. still coaching at the time. And I understood my value, right? My value, I wasn't going to pick anybody up 94 feet. I wasn't going <laughs> to, you know, go by somebody explosively. But I could be out there directing and leading and I could yeah. help elevate others. And it really set the stage for what I think coaching is about. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the X's and O's are critical, mm -hmm. but bigger than that is just, can you motivate people? Can you, can you unify oh, people? Can you create a fearless spirit inside somebody? And, and, and although I didn't know exactly what I was doing at the time, I was practicing that. Yeah, for sure. Even with the Jurassic park music, you know, being played when you run out on the floor, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they didn't do that to you, but, uh, <laughs> but, but no, like the player coach thing. I mean, that's something that you would hear like back in the seventies in the NBA, you know what I mean? Like the guy just, you know, kind of calling timeouts, but he's still got the uniform on. But uh, no, that's an, that's what an incredible transition that, that had to be, man. I mean, you're literally like one foot in, in, each world and then tw or excuse me 2005 you now I should say until now you stand as the current head coach at Indiana Wesleyan University um and so for a lot of coaches we've had on here they have a lot of different experiences yours is a lot quicker in that aspect because you go from a dobo right to a head coach so talk about maybe the immediate jump to a head coach maybe some bumps in the road that you have had kind of to start off well you know, first off, my brother's at Indiana Wesleyan and he calls me and he says, hey, I think they're going to fire our coach. You should apply. And I say, well, wow. they're not going to hire me. I'm a, I'm a director of operations. You know, like I'm at the bottom of the bottom. He's like, yeah, but here's what they're looking for. So anyways, I drive down to Indiana Wesleyan for the first time because our schedules had never allowed. I hand the AD my resume and I say, if you ever know of an open job, you know, keep me in mind. A kind of wink at him type deal. Right. Well, two, two months later, the job opens up. And I even went to Coach Drew at the time, and I was like, hey, can you help me get this job? And, and he was nice, and he said, look, maybe we can get an interview. It would be great experience. And I, too, thought, if I could just get an interview, you know, that's that's a start. Sure. Well, yeah. I get an interview, and uh, Coach Drew, because of his, you know, reputation and respect in the state of Indiana, got me that interview, got my foot in the door. So they hired me. I'm 24 years old. And I know I know nothing. I mean, I'm I wouldn't have hired myself. I, I do say that over and over because I've been on a lot of committees. And I'm like, nope, no. Nope, you know. <laughs> Somehow I fool enough people to get hired. I get the job. My I got a brother on the team who's a junior. They went seven and twenty-one the previous year, and uh, I'm I have one player who's older than me. He's a JUCO kid who's like twenty-four years old and nine wow. months. He's just slightly older than me. 
but man, it was just, it was fun. It was fun to start. I had a ton of passion. I'm not sure I, I knew really how to deal with people. And I think one of the things I learned along the way is just like, sometimes you can, you can players become commodities to help coaches get to certain places. And I think players can feel that, right. They can sure. feel if, if, if they're there for that only. And then early on, it was like, I felt the pressure to win as a young guy. And I felt the pressure to move and, that was kind of my perspective. And I think my players felt that. And, and as I settled in and had the right people around me to help me realize, like, look, you can still like be very demanding, but you got to figure out a way to do it in a way that's still loving because your players, they're yeah. going to feel that. And uh, sure. there were some there were some rough years early on. Um, there were some there were some brotherly fights like we used to have back in the home, you know, oh, of back course. in the day <laughs> uh, between my brother. But thankfully, we were able to recruit a lot of guys and, and get our own guys in here, you know, rather quickly. What is the biggest thing, like, obviously, you know, you're an assistant and you're kind of going through those early steps. What was the single biggest thing once you became a head coach that was just like, oh, damn, you know, like, because everybody has that thing of what it is, you know. Um, I remember what mine was. Doug will have one. He'll have his moment someday when he slides over 18 inches to the next seat. But what was that? What was that for you? Like, you know, like, oh, this is this is this is what being a head coach is all about now. This is real. Well, it's it's fun to make suggestions, and that's what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Not fun to make decisions. Yeah, right. Because right. <laughs> right. you have to live with those decisions, and I and I think early on, you, you think you have to make all the decisions. So I still yeah. think I try now to make a lot of suggestions, and I allow my assistants to make decisions. That way, all the weight isn't on me. Because sometimes, like, look, as leaders, we just get paralyzed, and like. It, if I don't make the right decision, we're doomed. And, and that's yeah. not how it works, but we tend to play it. Like if we don't guard the ball screen perfectly, the whole game plans off and you got to be able to spread that around and say, okay, yeah, let's everybody go to the table on this and talk about this. And then we'll come together as a collective decision. And so I, yeah. I don't carry that weight as much anymore about the decisions I have to make. Yeah, no, that's great. And you know, the beauty of it is your assistants feel that too, because those guys, you're probably watching them grow right before your eyes because you you're probably delegating and, you know, just letting them handle more things. And, you know, I have one of my favorite phrases is, you know, practice isn't just for players, mm -hmm. you know, coaches need practice coaching too, yep. you know, and especially when they're younger and they're trying to grow and develop their voice and develop that conviction in what they say, you know, um, that's such a big deal. So I, I know those guys are growing up right in front of your eyes. I'm sure. Yeah, well said. And now I want to mention, I know we touched on it very briefly, but you are the youngest coach to receive 500 wins currently with a record of, um, well, I should say when I wrote this up, it was 500 and 129. So you probably added another one or two to that. Um, but the only other coaches on that list of 500, have you seen that list by chance? I'm sure you have. Yeah, I've had some people share it with me. Yeah, I'm sure. I have to I have to make sure to throw it out there. John Calipari, Mark Few, Bill Self, Jerry Tarkanian, and Roy Williams are the only other coaches on that list with 500 wins, um, I should say, as, as in the youth. So how does it feel, one, to just be included on that list and have that honor? Yeah, I mean, it's humbling to be to be mentioned with guys like that, because honestly, I don't I don't think of myself in that way. And, and I've never been a numbers guy. And I mean that I've never been focused on it. Like last year when our SID department came to me and said, Hey, you're going to do this this year. We need to get ready for it. And I'm like, do what? You know, like, right. I got, right. A, I got, a, I got a basketball <laughs> when I won my, my 300th win. And the next day my kids were using it in the yard and it was like, you know, what am right. I going to do with that? Like put <laughs> right. it on the shelf or like, I'd right. rather have the kids use it. Um, yeah. I just honestly, Someday I think it'll mean something, you know, like someday when I'm done and can say, man, that that was a fun ride. But like, I'm just not a numbers guy right now. Um, yeah. so I don't I don't. But but the relationships, I mean, I got a lot of texts from former players and those have meant the most because mm -hmm. those guys we had bonded and we had went through life together. We had experienced highs and lows together. And then to hear where they're at now, like, yeah, I've been, it's my 19th year. So I've got guys that have children now. Yeah, uh, that's that's what's special about coaching. And if, if you're oh, lucky no. enough to stay in it this long that's the reoccurring paycheck that you get. No doubt. Well said, man. No, when you watch them grow up, man, that's special for sure. Love it. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of start talking a little bit on now the other part where we mentioned NAIA and your coaching philosophy. So 
being in the NAIA, obviously coaching basketball is coaching basketball. It's not like it's anything much different. But do you feel personally that it's different being in the NAIA rather than in the NCAA? Or is there anything different um, from your perspective? I think some of the best coaches uh, are obviously at any level. But, man, the NAIA has them. And for whatever reason, you know, we tend to, at least in the world, there are a lot of these uh, – these young kids minds. It's like, there's, there's just levels and hierarchies and I get yeah. it. Mm -hmm. The yeah. big 10 and high major, that's pretty special, but you get outside of that. There's not a difference really in terms of level of play between an NAI and a low major or division two. I mean, there's no question. There's a ton of talent. You know, I had a kid who had four or five NBA tryouts. He's now got a contract with the Pacers in the G league. I mean, we've got guys all over the world playing professional basketball Mm -hmm. And some of the best coaches because they stay, you know, I think you get better when you can stay in a place. And like, for instance, I came into the league, there were three coaches that had 700 victories. You know, I had, I had zero going into these games and, you know, I'm wow. trying to figure out how to beat these guys. Well, that, that made me better. Um, mm -hmm. And when you have somewhat limited resources, you, you got to get better with what you have. And so you're, and you do everything and you're, you're yeah. tasked with growing and learning. So over 19 years, I've been stretched. I think to grow and continue to get better as a coach. I think, a, you know, especially at a, a place like Indiana Wesleyan, like I, the, places like that, I think a lot of NAIA schools are this way. They have a great identity about who they are and like, you know, what type of kid's going to be successful here, what we're about as a university. I think it's easier probably to have a bond with your administration uh, <clears throat> just from a relationship perspective. And so when places know what, what they're about, they know what their identity is, they, they don't tend to get their head in the clouds about things. Mm -hmm. I think they have a great perspective about what's going on. And I think that actually helps the coaches, you know, regardless, you know, obviously basketball we're talking about, but coaches at all sports at schools like that, they know, like, I think there's a connection between, you know, the athletic department and the people up top. And I think that, because they say, hey, this is what fits. This is what we're about. This is this school's value system. And so that kind of helps you pull in who's going to be successful at a place like that. And that I think it's like it creates a shared perspective when the identity is pretty clear. Yeah, I think I think one of the things you're saying is there's there's depth. And I think if you look at any successful organization or team, it's when you have depth, which only happens over time when somebody yeah. decides to stay and plant themselves exactly you can grow something special right i mean no. the tallest trees have the deepest roots and we live in a transient culture especially the coaching culture and i'm not saying moving on is bad right when you settle somewhere you can really anchor in the ground and you can have influence so 100%. if if it's influence you want sometimes staying can produce it like i've got an assistant with me He's been here 18 of my 19 years. That's unheard of. Wow. In the assistant realm. Like he, he could have moved on many times and taken a head job, but he's not chasing the status or the level or the money. He wants influence. Well, his greatest opportunity to influence is to stay and to create something special. And he's done that here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Don't, don't mess with happy as Mark says. Hmm. Hmm. Who's in your club, then, by the way? Who, who's in your club, by the way? We'll, we'll, throw that, we'll throw that out there. I'm in his club, I think. <laughs> and then I know I saw a bunch of things on um, talking about you, but I even see it behind you, too. So we got to have to make sure to touch about that. It says, for the people who necessarily can't see, but it says, I am third. So can you talk about that? Because this is kind of going to lead us into what we want to talk on next. But just give us kind of an idea of what that has to do. Yeah, you know, we mentioned identity earlier, and and our identity here at Indiana Wesleyan is what we call I am third. Uh, and, and what I say is it's the paradox of success. Uh, I am third stands for God first, other second, self third. And the reality of, of our world, I think the message is me first, everybody else, you know, after that, right? If yeah, I want to, yeah. our young people are told, like, you got to look out for yourself. And, and the only way you're going to have successful is to look out for yourself. We have parents telling kids, Man, go get your shot. Make sure you get your minutes. Make sure everything in life's about you. Yeah. But I think what we're finding is, one, life doesn't work that way. And, and for sure, teams don't work that way. Mm -hmm. But it's also just kind of a miserable way to live. And so, you know, we've we've said, like, what if we reverse that and actually said we don't focus in on ourselves, but we put our first focus on God and others? You know, 
what might happen? And I'll be honest, as a young coach, I like, it sounds good when it's up on a wall, but it's like, how do you bring that to life? Like, right. How do you actually beat your opponents by putting God first and other people second? And uh, that's the journey of coaching for me is figuring out how this comes into everyday practice, everyday coaches, uh, meetings, and just life. And my goal is that when our guys leave, that's what they have. That's the script for being a good dad. That's the script yeah. for being a, a, a person in their community who's a pillar. Uh, you name it, you know, a good husband. No and doubt. So it's it's become a lot bigger than the basketball court. But I'll tell you this, it does feel the way we play and the, and the mentality we want to have as we play. Yeah. Love it. And then kind of piggybacking off of that, like every year um, you – have a different team, right? You have a different set of people. So what is your philosophy going into every year? Is there anything in particular that you kind of have maybe outside of that or is there, or anything in general, really your philosophy? Well, I think the hardest thing to do in coaching is to create consistent success. Um, we all can have a pop-up year, right? It's based upon talent, the ball rolls our way, but to create something and sustain it over time is really difficult. And for us, it's the culture and the culture is going to reproduce itself. And we're at a place now where, like, for instance, our freshmen come in this year and our seniors, they're teaching and driving home this idea of what does it mean to be third? And yeah. uh, in some ways, I'm sitting in the back watching and observing. I get behind it when needed. But the, but the onus and the pressure isn't on me. And every year you're going to have different team. You know, last year we were we were big and slow. We had a seven footer. This year we're fast. We can spread you out. And so every year the system's going to change in mm -hmm. terms of how we play on the court, but the mentality stays the same. So one thing we say is that men mentality always trumps system. And so we will ingrain into our guys the same mentality year in and year out. We talked about I am third. That's the one mentality we have to do. The other is what we call fearless. We're trying to create a player who's can play without fear, can play without thinking. Um, Cause I think, I think coaching has changed in terms of when I was a kid, Fear was the great motivator. If you were a right. good coach, you knew yeah. how to use fear to bring about a certain level of result. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that's changed, right? Yeah, and no you doubt. can argue, should it change? Are kids soft? Whatever. The reality is it is what it is. Yeah. And I long, no longer see fear as a motivator. It's a paralyzer. And so my job then is to take fear out of the game. And, and you can see how, I mean, we could go into this for hours, but I am third <laughs> and fearless play off each other. Like mm -hmm. if you're I am third, but you're not fearless, what you are is, is rather passive. You just kind of defer to others. If you're fearless without I am third, you can be pretty selfish. You're just out there trying to be aggressive for yourself. But if you combine those two, what you get is a player who both plays selflessly and aggressive. Now yeah. you talk about a combination, like to me, oh, that's man. a combination of greatness, right? That's if I can go out there and play free, but play for the benefit of others, the whole team rises because everybody's doing that same thing, right? That, that's the whole, I think, when I talk to guys about being third, the first question they have is, well, what about me, coach? Who's going to look out for me? <laughs> right. What I say is, look right. around. If all 15 guys worry about you, that's 15 people. That's that's so much better than you worrying about you. I, yeah, for sure. I, I can help you get to where you want to get a lot faster if you just stop thinking about yourself. Right. And so yeah. we're going to try to train and teach and coach those mentalities, and then it doesn't matter what system. Like, you could tell me, hey, you have to run flex. I think I can make it work if I get a player who's third and, and fearless. Or you could say, yeah. hey, you got you to run ball screen continuity. I probably could figure out a way to make it work if our players are ingrained to think fearlessly and I'm third, which is selflessly. So mentality. The thing, the thing I love about this, Greg, is like you guys have figured out that our greatest, your greatest competition isn't your opponents. Like as coaches, our greatest competition is society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like that you know you got your 30 35 opponents on the schedule you know some you play once conference a couple times twice whatever conference tournament maybe you see somebody a third time in a season you can live with that but society like that's a 365 day <laughs> opponent <laughs> every single day like because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a group of guys to do what society says they can't do. Yep. So and as just, a result, like that, that opponent never goes away. And I think, I mean, social media has exacerbated all this. I mean, oh, oh, completely. Gosh, yeah, like sure. none of us played, or at least maybe Doug, he looks young. He played. Social <laughs> media, but I didn't walk out of a game and had the pressure to, to post something to thousands yep. of people about who I am, my performance. Yeah. 
But yeah, what we do now, and it's all looking inward, and it's all saying like you're the center of all this. And then they no walk doubt. in our locker room, and coaches are going, no, 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 you're yeah. not the center. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. To your point, that's our battle. And too that's often, it. you know, I think we focus that's on it. like, well, my kids don't close out, and they don't do all these things. Yes, that's true. But man, you got to get over that first hump of just the self-centeredness before that's you it. start worrying about the other stuff. No doubt. No, completely. And I mean, that's the biggest thing, like you said, with social media, people seeing. I know all the time kids talk about like, oh, yeah, did you see my video? Or, oh, yeah, you got my highlights up. I, oh, I had a career high last night. And, you know, the school's posting it and all that. So it definitely to be able to kind of ingrain that out of kids' heads. So that's why one thing I really wanted to make sure to touch on was your I am third, because that's huge. You know, when you start thinking about or at least buying into your own atmosphere, your own team, the amount of things that can be accomplished are insane. Um, but Going off of that, so let's talk a little bit more about like kind of the basketball side of things. So some offensive staples. Now, obviously, you don't have to go in depth in telling us everything that, you know, behind the scenes that you do. But obviously what you're doing is extremely successful and it's working. So what are some offensive staples that maybe you could share that, that would help some other coaches? Well, I, I would go back to that mentality. So we're going to really ingrain into our guys of what it means to create for others. Um, because most players grow up in a system and they think about themselves only when the ball's in their hands. Mm -hmm. Their parents have paid thousands of dollars throughout their, you know, little Johnny's career to have him trained. And the yeah. trainer's showing him all these moves, you know, that yeah. are like moves, counter moves. Yeah. Tack the cones, cones tack the yeah. chair. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And then he comes in and we're like, hey, look, 99% of this game is played when the ball is not in your hands. And he's like, well, nobody ever told me that. <laughs> yeah. So what we're trying and to plus do is. And the cone never defended me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're left with the mess to say, okay, we need to teach you how to play. And I think right. that's when it comes down to it, like we, we try to spend a lot of time teaching our guys how to play. And it's often how to play when the ball is not in your hands. And this this takes time. This mm -hmm. takes patience. We don't run a lot of plays at Indiana Wesleyan because, once again, we, we want to teach you how to play. Therefore, when you get in a game, you're not looking over at the sidelines asking, you know, well, what play are we running? It's like yeah. just do what the defense is giving you, right? Exactly. And yeah. so our system, you know, over the years, sometimes it's four out, sometimes it's five out. But it's this idea – we, we want you to watch us and just say, man, there's something different about the way those guys play for each other. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that just loves to screen. There's a guy that loves to pass. Sometimes shooting is a way you create for other people, right? You're creating space. So like you better catch it and you better be fearless and, and be able to shoot that ball. And so I think defining roles over time in practice is a, is a, is a long process. It's a tedious practice process, but mm -hmm. it's just something you got to do as a coach. If you're going to, if you're going to have an offense, that's, that's attacking and very difficult to defend. For sure. And then I was going to say, I mean, I'm sure you can even kind of attest to this to the same things that you mentioned, but kind of more on like the defensive side of things. Is there anything um, <clears throat> that maybe you would want to touch on there? Well, we've we've always just been man to man. And uh, I think for me, it's just trying to create that unified defense, which is hard because because once again, it's like the, the mentality that we receive guys with is, well, if my guy doesn't have the ball, I'm good. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're all five guarding the basketball. Like, right. 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 And that's you can tell guys that you can show them in film, but somehow you got to create that collectiveness. And uh, mm -hmm. that's hard to do once again to get guys to buy in and. You know, there's been years where we try to keep it on the side. There's been years where we're, you know, more pack. Those things will vary. There's been years where sure. we'll pick up. But yeah. just, like, are we unified? If a guy takes a charge, does everybody go help him up? Like, I'm far more concerned about that than, no like, doubt. you know, can we execute a shell drill and be in the precise spot? Because there's times where you can be in the right spot and have the wrong mentality. Therefore, you're in the wrong spot. You mm -hmm. could be in the wrong spot but have the right mentality and make up for it, and you're in the right spot. So just – once again, ingraining these mentalities that we're going to play unified and we're going to play fearless. And I think over time that can create a pretty solid defensive team. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that That's the, you know, you don't hear people talk about unselfish defensive teams very often, but that's like a huge part of that end of the floor. You know, it's just that, that there's still a, a creating and giving and, and doing what's best for others on that end, whether it's a, you know, a, a rotation, like you said, a charge. Is it, you know, hey, I, it's transition. I don't have my guy. Fine. You know, 
let's deal with it. You know, hey, the uh, our big is stuck on a small guy in transition. Okay, let's load up for him. Exactly. Right. That's still a form of unselfish acts. Like we're here for this guy, you know. So having that mentality can show itself in so many ways. I mean, so much people talk about off, unselfish offensive basketball, but there's an amazing defensive aspect of unselfishness, you know, that, yeah. from that belongs on that end of the court for mm-hmm. sure. And especially a big thing that I, I heard in there too, and it kind of brings me back to my high school. <coughs> my, head, my head coach, I mean, I know this is kind of irrelevant, but was very big on um, discipline. <clears throat> and especially in a like that's kind of one thing. You give a little more freedom, from my understanding, but then you also are disciplined with the kids to make them like, no, we're not doing this individually. We're doing this together. And I mean, that, that right there, I feel like you don't need the X's and O's necessarily as much because if you can keep kids in line and have them do what you're looking to do all together as a unit, I mean, I feel like the things that you can achieve are probably, well, obviously, you <laughs> it's 500 to 129 shows a lot and says a lot. So, well, um, let, me, I, let me follow up on that real quick because I think you make yeah. a great point. Um, mm-hmm. it's, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another paradox. Uh, Love it. <laughs> it's the idea that discipline actually equals freedom. Right. So saying no to something actually means I'm saying something yes to something greater. So, for instance, I love chocolate chip cookies and I it's my my one weakness. Right. We all got them. But if I can say no to chocolate chip cookies, I'm saying yes to a healthy lifestyle. Right. I actually go to sleep better at night if I don't eat five chocolate chip cookies. (laughs) It's the same thing with our players with discipline. Like initially they look at discipline as like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you keeping me from? Right. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. when I'm saying, no, no, I'm inviting you into something greater. Like, right. If you can discipline yourself on defense. I'm not keeping you from steals. I'm inviting you into being better, more sound or shot yeah. selection. Right. Like if I can discipline you to take better shots, you're actually going to score more baskets. Now, they don't yeah. they don't initially think that. But as they understand and as you teach them how to play, they understand that the discipline you're bringing as a coach, it's not punishment. It's actually inviting them into becoming a better player. And the players that accept that are the ones that become great. Yeah. And those are the guys you love to coach. Yeah, for sure. I got a question, Greg, and this is kind of drawing a comparison from when you first started as a head coach to now. Did you find in your first few years that you would make corrections and it would be like you would go maybe at a particular guy that made that mistake? And now as you get as you progress in your career, you're saying, hey, this is something we don't do. So you're, you know, now if it's an effort related issue, then maybe you can call a guy out a little bit. But if it's a system related issue, now it's like, hey, guys, this is this. That's not what we do, as opposed to, mm-hmm. hey, you're a knucklehead for not making that rotation What that, you know, bleep, bleep, bleep is wrong with you. You're like you, you must know, have film of me as a young coach because <laughs> you're reading my mail right no, now. But, uh, um, that, I, I was thinking about that as you were going on, because, I mean, I, I think that's every I think that's a that's a path that every coach has to take, I think, you know, early on. Um, And sometimes, you know, younger coaches, you're a product of how you were coached and you're a product of how whoever coached you coached them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, but is that something that you found early in in your career? And then as you move on later, it became a, a we correction as opposed to a personal correction. 100%. And here's how I would say that, like early on, I, I demanded perfection, and then I expected perfection, which is unreal, unrealistic. Now I still demand perfection, I just understand who we're not going to be perfect. So letting guys make mistakes. And that's part of being fearless, I think, is understanding that like, failure is a big part of this process. In fact, right, we want failure. You know, when I was a young Mm -hmm. coach, it was like, we will avoid failure today, fellas, like we're going to avoid it. It's like, right, well, if we avoid it, like, we're not yeah, sitting how, high enough. How are we getting? <laughs> right, right. So now our guys can walk into practice and say, you know what? There's freedom to fail as long yeah. as I'm going 100%, as long as I'm playing selflessly. And yeah. coach isn't going to make this personal. You know, I, I'll right. be honest. I think I made it personal when when, when guys, when they, when my first couple of years. Now mm-hmm. it's like, to your point, hey, look, we're not locked in. We're not focused. Let's, let's figure out a way that we can do this better. Right. And I think for some reason – it's, it's just inherent in young coaches to think things are going to go perfectly. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like we plan yeah. out a practice, we watch film, we show them this is how we're guarding this action. 
and then they don't guard it that way and we lose our minds. That's just <laughs> basketball, right? I mean, right. That's, just, right. that's just the way it works. And we, it's not football where the, the clock stops. We walk back to the huddle. We yeah, you got 30 like, seconds. Yeah. We're still going. So, like, no we've got to forget about that. And we've got to go to the next play. And I think sometimes we get in the way as coaches by just nitpicking about perfection all the time. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great point. And I, I think it sounds like you've gotten your guys to the point where not only are they fearless – they're at the point where they almost embrace failure and now it's a teaching tool, mm-hmm. right? Like now, instead of a stumbling block, failure is a stepping stone now. You know, same thing just happened, same turnover, but how it got, how it gets looked at in the, in the art gallery of what we're doing, you know, it's like we just walk to the other side of the room and the light hits it a little different and it's like, all right, same thing just happened, but now how do we get better from this as opposed to, you know, uh, chaos. In exactly. Exactly. Well, Alan, do you have any final questions before we cut into the final segment? No, you know, the, the one thing I, I did ask and, and you actually hit on it because it, the logo, thankfully he did, the, he did the pod in this room. Cause the one thing I was going to ask is what, what are one of the things that makes his program unique, but it's right behind uh-huh. him on the wall. Yep. And so um, that, you know, that question got answered, you know, er- way earlier in this. Yeah. I had yeah, it. So. I had it in mind too. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but you answered it more than enough times. Oh, for um, sure. So like I said, we'll get into the final segment here. What we call is three quick hitters. And then after that, we'll round it up with one final question and then we'll be all done. But the this three is, quick this hitters. Is, this is rising coaches, family feud style, man. So get ready. <laughs> here, we, here we come. So really all it is is just three quick hitters, three quick questions to kind of, like I said, personalize you, let everybody know who you are as an individual, but they're also tied a little bit still with kind of basketball as well. So um, first things first, for you, what's your favorite part of coaching? Oh, it's just the relationships, the, the depth of relationships. You know, we can be in a locker room one minute, chest bumping, throwing our shirts off. The next minute we could be crying <laughs> about a loss. And there's just this mm-hmm. like – intensity Range. that what other Range. job can you go to and and no. sweat with yeah. your guys cry with your guys celebrate it's it's incredible no doubt outside of basketball what can they find or what can somebody find you doing i'm a big hunter man i uh i have okay. dreams of becoming a professional hunter so if, I, if anybody out there is looking for a professional hunter <laughs> that's be my transition. i love bow hunting okay um yeah, that's what you can find me doing. Keep that crossbar to practice if they're slow getting back on transition. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I specifically wanted to ask this to you, especially because you've had a successful head coaching career and you're still a young coach. Um, but how do you personally find, or I should say define success? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um it certainly isn't, you know, the wins and the losses. It's it's the impact I think you can make on young people. And we hear that a lot in coaching. And specifically, my calling is to help young people grow in their faith. And the I am third mentality is connecting them to God, helping them serve other people. Because once they leave this place, you know, I want to give them a script for the rest of their lives. And uh, mm-hmm. and I think, and I'll say this, and, and this, this is for a lot of young coaches out there. Like, most of them are chasing their ambitions, which, which isn't necessarily wrong. But when you find your calling and your purpose – there's nothing better and really honing in on that and finding that. And I feel like I found my purpose because people have asked me like, why have you stayed? Why haven't you left? And it's like, because I found my purpose and I love it and I'm really fulfilled. It doesn't mean everything's perfect. doesn't mean I don't have bad days, but man, I'm in my wheelhouse right now and I'm thankful for this opportunity that I have. No doubt. No, I, I, uh, I like the acronym W H Y. Like, you know, people always talk about finding your why. And if you want to know what that is, it's what hypes you, W-H-Y, mm-hmm. you know, and if you figure that out, like that's where the magic happens, man. So, uh, yeah, you hit the, you, you hit the nail on the head with the word wheelhouse. Cause it, it's, it's clear, um, you know, you, your program, what you guys are doing, your identity, what you're about. It's like totally connected to the way you play. It's and that's then reflected in how they live. Right. And so that's, I mean, you know, that's you're in one of the rare sweet spots in our profession, which is mm-hmm. awesome. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And then the final question that we like to ask, uh, really just kind of a 
cover for rising coaches, but of course there's a lot, but what is your top, if you could pick one best <coughs> piece of advice for young rising coaches who are trying to get their foot in the door and then how can they accomplish that goal? Oh man. I think just don't worry about where you're starting. Just, you know, be willing to, to go anywhere and to get that foot in the door. And that, that means title. That means pay. That means position. And surround yourself with good people. You know, if you just get with somebody who's good, they're going to train you, but you can also ride their success and hopefully, you know, get an opportunity from them. <laughs> but yeah, All right. great answer. Great answer. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> what, that's what this platform needs to hear, man. Love it. This is awesome. We have fun doing this, guys. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and then any final comments, questions anybody can add before I get to the closing closing remarks? No, nah, hey, I just want to say thank you again, Greg, for doing this, man. Um, I'm a I'm an Indiana Wesleyan fan now, for sure. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yep. So hopefully I can make it up, uh, uh, make it up and watch you guys play at some point, you know, before the season's over and just shake your hand and say hello. But uh, that'd be awesome. Just huge, huge props to what you're doing, man. Like you're you're what this profession is all about and what should be what it should be about. So uh, I know it's in a starting to think of the season and the wheels are turning right now. So thank you. Again. Just for, <laughs> thanks for taking the time to do this, man. This is a lot of fun. It was fun for me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, coach Honigal. And then uh, again, that, that does it again for another episode of the rising coaches podcast. I'm Doug Caputo alongside Alan major. Keep working, keep rising coaches. Take care. Oh, 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 oh,